Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here uh, today, and I want to thank Dr. Elson and Dr. Grothy for their um, kind invitation. So what I wanted to talk to you about today, sorry, how does, David, how does it go forward? Does it? Yeah, no, the green. Oh, thanks. That's just the mouse. Okay, perfect. So, so what I wanted to talk to you about today is the role of aspirin in colon cancer uh, risk reduction. But to give you a little bit of history, this is certainly not a new drug. In fact, um, aspirin in, um, has been around for thousands of years. We know that salicylate-rich plants, like the white willow tree um, depicted here, uh, as well as the myrtle plant, um, have been used by ancient civilizations, including the Egyptians, the Greek, and the Chinese. Hippocrates mentioned it um, for use of the willow tree bark in, in tea as a form of analgesic f during childbirth, as well as for um, its antipyretic effects. But it wasn't until 1853 that Charles Frederick Gerhardt, a French chemist, actually um, synthesized um, acetylsilic acid or aspirin. It was in 1900 or 1899 that Arthur Eichengren and Felix um, Hoffman from Germany um, recognized the potential medical um, benefits of this drug within the setting of working for Bayer and trademarked aspirin, and it was registered worldwide and was the most um, uh, commonly prescribed uh, medicine in the first half of the 20th century. So, of course, we have come a long way in our understanding of what aspirin does, and it's certainly more than just an analgesic uh, or an anti-fever drug. Uh, the best evidence um, for aspirin and disease reduction actually is for the reduction of cardiovascular disease. And there is very good data suggesting that lifelong low-dose aspirin is recommended for patients after a cardiovascular disease event, so a secondary prevention. The primary prevention data is a little bit more, um, uh, less formal and a little bit more com controversial, but pooled analysis do suggest that low-dose aspirin is associated with a 17% reduction in non-fatal MIs, 14% reduction in non-fatal strokes. Initially, it was thought that there was a separation between gender, between men and women, with women having more benefit in terms of stroke reduction and men for um, MI, but that no longer holds. Um, it also is uh, associated with a small but potentially significant reduction in all-cause mortality. Guidelines uh, now exist for identifying at-risk populations who potentially would benefit from uh, cardiovascular uh, risk reductions. And in fact, nearly 40% of the U.S. population who is greater than age 50 uses aspirin for primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Now, how does um, aspirin cause disease risk reduction in terms of cardiovascular disease or colon cancer risk? But we all know it's an irreversible inhibitor of, of COX-1 and COX-2, also knows, known as prostaglandin uh, synthase 1 and prostaglandin synthase 2. And through these effects, there are antiplatelet effects of aspirin that we are very familiar with in the cardiovascular world. There are anti-inflammatory effects. Um, there are effects on, um, on epithelial cell proliferation and survival, and also um, it's quite active in suppressing the VINT um, beta-catenin uh, pathway, which we know is involved in colorectal cancer progression. The epidemiologic evidence for, for aspirin and colon cancer risk reduction, however, mostly initially came from pooled analysis of cohort and case control studies. Um, one study in JAMA in 2015 suggested that there was nearly a 30% risk reduction in colon cancer uh, uh, risk in patients who took long-term aspirin. A European study from Denmark suggested a 27% risk reduction. But again, these were all cohort and case control studies, which we all know are, have potential confounders, some known, some unknown. So most of the secondary data for colon cancer prevention truly came from randomized clinical trials of aspirin in cardiovascular diseases. So these are some of the uh, trials um, that some of which you have uh, certainly heard about. And what you see is in the first uh, three uh, trials, um, um, there is about a 25% decrease in colon cancer incidence and nearly a 40% reduction in colon cancer mortality with the use of long-term aspirin at various doses, largely low dose. 
What was perhaps a little bit more disappointing initially is that in the physician's health study, as well as in the women's health study, and in a study by John Burns on Lynch syndrome patients, initial data suggested that aspirin was not helpful. And this is quite disappointing and did not make sense. However, with longer-term follow-up, which I'll show you, there does seem to be a difference, especially in the women's health study, in terms of colon cancer risk reduction. But what you see here is that the colon cancer risk reduction is really not evident in the women's health study until after 10 years of follow-up. So really, it's 18 years of follow-up you, that you have here, and where you really see the separation of the curves in the patients who took aspirin versus those that didn't. And just to remind you, this was low-dose aspirin every other day. So maybe a more feasible um, study is to look at adenoma. As we know, adenomas can progress to adenocarcinoma. Maybe that's a better um, a study to look at shorter-term outcomes. And in fact, there have been a number of studies in um, looking at aspirin for recurrent adenoma uh, reduction. And Generally, they are associated with as little as a 4 to as much as a 40% risk reduction in, in adenoma, suggesting that eventually these patients will benefit from um, cancer risk reduction. Oops, let me just go back. Okay. So then what are the risk factors, however, for, um, for aspirin? So we certainly know that it's associated with an increased risk of GI bleeding, and that risk is thought to be over various studies about 1.31 overall increase over the general population risk of bleeding, or in other words, one to two major gastrointestinal bleeds per 1,000 person years. We know that higher dose as well as longer duration may be associated with greater risk of bleeding. We know that patients who have a history of GI ulcers have, have about a two to three-fold increased risk of bleeding. Upper GI pain, pain, bleeding disorders, renal failure, thrombocytopenia, which a lot of our patients certainly have, and severe liver disease are all also associated with risk. Intracranial bleeding risk is more closely associated with uncontrolled hypertension. Um, and both GI and intracranial uh, bleeding risk is associated with male sex as well as older age. So the risk of bleeding from aspirin does seem to be dose dependent. This is a very nice study that was uh, published by um, Andrew uh, Chan up at Mass General Hospital looking at the, the Nurthus Health Study. Um, where over 87,000 women were enrolled and 1,500 women had a major a bleed. And what you see in the um, uh, red box is the more aspirin that the patients took, the higher the risk of bleeding, including a two-fold increased risk for patients who were taking over 14 um, uh, aspirins, full aspirins per week. Um, the 0.5 to 1.5 uh, full dose is equivalent to roughly a low dose aspirin per day. So you can see that the increase in risk of bleeding is really not that much in at least the low dose um, aspirin. And the risk of bleeding is much more closely linked to dose rather than do duration of treatment with aspirin. In fact, there is one very interesting study suggesting that the most um, most of the bleeds in terms of GI bleeds occur within the first three years of aspirin use. After that, the risk of bleeding seems to decrease. So is there an optimal dose? Well, some studies suggest that moderate or even um, alternate, every, uh, alternate day low dose aspirin is su sufficient, but other trials suggest that maybe for chemo prevention benefit, higher doses are needed. I think it's safe to say that for today, given the adverse effects are, are known to be associated with the higher doses of aspirin, and since the optimal dose is still unclear, generally high doses are not routinely recommended. Enteric-coated or buffered formulations do not clearly reduce the adverse uh, GI effects of the major complications. So what's the optimal duration? Well, if we were just looking for adenoma recurrence, it's probably shorter term, but obviously we are all interested in cancer incidence. And there is good data to suggest now that the aspirin does have to be taken for five to 10 years, and it has to be taken relatively consistently. So the 2007 US Preventive Services Task Force um, 
gave recommendations in terms of the use of aspirin, and these were updated in 2015. And I'm just highlighting the old recommendations um, just to make you aware of how um, different the new recommendations, new recommendations are. So they recommended against the routine use of aspirin or ANSAS for prevention of colorectal cancer in average risk patients. Why? Because the harm out, harms outweigh the benefits for the pre prevention of colorectal cancer. However, in a 2015 reanalysis, the potential long-term benefit on colorectal ca cancer mortality was significant when they pulled data from three primary and secondary cardiovascular studies. They showed a 40% reduction in colon cancer incidence with aspirin use. And this mortality benefit, again, did not become apparent until 10 to 20 years after randomization, suggesting that if you're going to use aspirin for colon cancer risk reduction, you should use it earlier so that that patient can have a benefit um, in terms of dose, um, variable doses, but there's no um, evidence of dose-related effect in terms of treatment. Studies suggest that at least, again, five to 10 years of uh, treatment is, is, um, is recommended. So in terms of the new guidelines, there is inclusion of colon cancer prevention into their rationale for routine low-dose aspirin use among certain subgroups of adults with specific cardiovascular risk profiles, and I'll show you that in a second. And what I think is notable here, here is aspirin is now the first pharmacologic agent to be endorsed by the task force for chemo prevention of a cancer in a population that's not characterized as high risk. So this is different than the tamoxifen and breast cancer reduction for high risk patients, which I think is quite notable. And the specific recommendations that you see here, I'll focus on the last two first because they're the easiest. For under 50, there's insufficient data to recommend treatment. For over 50, or I'm sorry, over 70, there is inf insufficient evidence because there is a higher risk of bleeding and an intracranial hemorrhage in those patients. But for patients who are age 50 to 59, irrespective of gender, and have a greater than 10% 10-year cardiovascular risk as assessed by the American Heart Association uh, calculator, they do recommend low-dose aspirin uh, use for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease and colorectal cancer with the caveats that the patient is not at increased risk of bleeding, they have a life expectancy of at least 10 years, and they're willing to really take it uh, on a daily basis. For age 60 to 69, the recommendations are less firm. It's an individualized uh, decision uh, between the patient and the physician, and obviously the patients are more likely benef to benefit if they're not at an increased risk of bleeding and all the other um, caveats go with it. So, but I think for the 50 to 59 age group, this is a really important um, modification of current guidelines. So, as a result of these tests for guidelines, there was also an interest in looking at longer term follow up um, in the nurses' health study and the um, and the health professional study for other cancer risks and associated risk reduction with aspirin. So this is a very nice study that was published just recently in JAMA, um, again, looking at a huge population of uh, 130,000 um, um, individuals followed for as long as 32 years. And what you saw in this population is that there was a small but significant 3% uh, reduction in the overall cancer incidence in the patients who, um, who took aspirin. But when you look a little bit more closely, most of this was driven by the GI tract cancers, who you see here had a 15% reduction in cancer um, incident. If you look even more closely, most of the GI tract reductions were driven by the colorectal cancer patients, right, who had a 20% risk reduction. What also is notable is that the gastroesophageal patients had a trend. It wasn't quite statistically significant overall. It was significant, I believe, in the men, but there was a, a trend in terms of decrease in esophageal uh, risk with aspirin use. There is some additional data that perhaps patients with Barrett's esophagus do benefit from aspirin. The jury is still out on that. What's also notice, notable here um, is that for pancreas cancer, there was no decreased um, risk with the use of aspirin. There was a study recently in CBP published in 2016 from um, Shanghai, suggest, it was a case control study suggesting that aspirin was beneficial in pancreas cancer. 
because it's a case, because it's a case control study um, from a very limited population. Again, extrapolation of that study to the wide pancreas um, cancer uh, patients is not appropriate. And I think this is helpful data suggesting that it may not be the same in pancreas cancer. Notably, also, there was no benefit of aspirin in terms of lung cancer um, risk reduction, breast cancer, or advanced prostate cancer. So in addition to suggesting these long-term benefits for the GI tract uh, cancers, especially colorectal cancer, um, what was also evident um, is that for GI tract cancers, 0.5 or to 1.5 standard aspirins, again, daily low-dose aspirin was sufficient. Minimum duration of regular use uh, was six years, so you do need to use it for a longer period of time. What the study also did that was really interesting um, is that it calculated the population attributable risk, which is basically how, ma how much of the cancers can be account for if, if everyone used um, aspirin, how much cancers could we prevent. And what they found is that 8% of all GI cancers and nearly 11% of colon cancers could have been prevented with the regular use of aspirin, which I think is a really interesting and, and phenomenal number. In addition, we know that um, patients are not um, very compliant with their colonoscopy screening. And could aspirin per perhaps complement colorectal cancer screening? And in fact, what they calculated is that 17% of colorectal cancers could have been prevented in patients who did not have a colonoscopy, and 8.5% um, could have been prevented in patients who did have a colonoscopy. So in areas where colonoscopy is not available, and certainly in patients who don't do their colonoscopies, this is an option. So now I'll quickly transition to aspirin and colorectal uh, cancer survivors. The initial data came out uh, for this um, in, in 2009, where what was demonstrated in, pa in patients with stage one, two, and three colorectal cancer was a decrease in um, colon cancer-specific mortality and overall mortality with the use of aspirin. Again, this was a study by uh, Andrew Chan and colleagues. What was also interesting is that there were a number of follow-up studies and a number of uh, studies showing very similar uh, risk reduction in patients who had colorectal cancer who used aspirin after diagnosis. But perhaps that there, are, there are markers um, that may make um, aspirin a better choice in certain patients. So there, is evidence, there was evidence from the initial study that patients who had overexpression of COX-2 or, or prostaglandin synthase 2 had a better outcome to aspirin or patients who had pic 3 ca mutant uh, colorectal cancer that I'll show you on the uh, next slide. So these biomarkers as a way of sort of optimizing patients for selection of aspirin therapy are still evolving. This is the pic 3 ca data, um, which was in New England Journal uh, five years ago now, suggesting what you see on the left side is a dramatic decrease in colon cancer-specific mortality and overall mortality in patients who took aspirin and were pic 3 ca mutant, while on the right side, what you see is there is no difference in the patients who did not have a pic 3 ca mutation. So, um, of course, these studies are somewhat biased in how we accrued patients, and one of the most um, elegant studies uh, that was published in JCO this past year um, was a cancer registry of Norway, and this was an observational population-based retrospective cohort study of colon cancer patients, and data was linked with their aspirin use data through the, the Norwegian prescription database, and what's amazing to us here in the States is that the registries cover more than 99% of the Nor Norwegian population and include all patients in an unselected and consecutive manner. So this is a good study of an unselected population. 23,000 patients were diagnosed with colon cancer, of whom 26% took aspirin. And what you see is that there is a, a decrease in colon cancer-specific um, uh, survival and uh, probably also a small decrease in overall survival in patients who took aspirin in this unselected uh, population of colorectal cancer patients. There have also been meta-analysis uh, looking at post-diagnosis versus pre-diagnosis aspirin. These are some of the studies that were um, included in that uh, meta-analysis, suggesting that post-diagnosis aspirin is uh, associated with about a 16% reduction in, um, in death from colorectal cancer. Um, there is no association based on this meta-analysis between pre-diagnosis aspirin and overall or, co or, um, or colon-specific mortality. So the meta-analysis also looked at PIC3CA uh, PIC um, uh, and um, COX-2 uh, expression, 
the uh, New England Journal suggesting the beneficial effects of aspirin in, in the mutant PIG3CA was not corroborated by some of the other studies, as you see on the left there. But nonetheless, in the meta-analysis, because of the strength of the New England Journal study, there was still uh, a benefit in terms of, um, of aspirin in the, in the uh, PIG3CA mutant cases. And same with the COX-2 expression. So in conclusion, there are now multiple studies in our colon cancer survivors that low-dose aspirin after a diagnosis of colon cancer decreases risk of recurrence and death. The extent of the benefit probably depends on pre versus post, COX-2, PIK3CA, and probably many other markers that we are not aware of yet. Uncertainty regarding the optimal time, duration, and dose, although I have to say that generally, uh, other than a low-dose aspirin, one would not want to use a higher-dose aspirin for this purpose. Um, I think it's fair to say that survivors of colorectal cancer can consider taking a low-dose aspirin. If you're going to do that, you sh and, if, and if the patient received the adjuvant chemotherapy, clearly you should wait until their thrombocytopenia resolves. Um, discussion of risks of GI bleeding and intracranial bleed should obviously take place. And there are a number of ongoing studies to help determine how to optimize our selection of patients who may truly benefit from aspirin therapy. So thank you.